So we have the following interpretations of Euler's number. Euler's number, as we first defined it, was the constant obtained by compounding at a rate of 1 over n, compounding n times, and then letting n go to infinity. So it's exactly the number that you get as the limit as n tends towards infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n. If we wanted to do this via calculus, we could express it as the constant for which the associated exponential function satisfies d on dx of the exponential e to the x is exactly itself again. If we wanted to express this derivative condition in terms of integrals, then it's the solution t of the equation the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x dx is equal to 1. So what we see is that these are not geometric characterizations of Euler's number. The compound interest approach is certainly not geometric. I didn't draw any pictures and the geometry is not clear at all. It's more of an analytic interpretation. The derivative or the integral approach is not even a characterization in my opinion. It's more of a discovery of Euler's number. And they're much more complicated than the definitions that we can give for pi. So perhaps we're not understanding exactly why pi and Euler's number are linked at all. The standard reason for linking pi and e is that both are transcendental numbers. To remind ourselves of what transcendental numbers are, let's first think about what it means for a number to be algebraic. What can we do with algebra? Well, we can essentially do two things. We can add, and we can multiply. A function is said to be algebraic if it can be constructed exactly out of addition and multiplication. So let's see an example of this. If I take a variable x, then I can add a number to it. So let's take x plus 3. This function is algebraic. x plus 3 is a linear polynomial. We can then multiply by some number or again by the variable. So if I had x times x plus 3, which we could simplify to just x squared plus 3x, then that would also be an algebraic function. We could then multiply again, perhaps by 2 and x, in which case we'd have 2x times x squared plus 3x. And if we expanded this out, we get 2x cubed plus 6x squared. So the algebraic functions are just the polynomials we're familiar with. So they're expressions that are just multiples of powers of x. They're just linear combinations of powers of x, and we're going to take the coefficients to be rational numbers. So what do we mean when we say that a number is algebraic? Well, a number is algebraic if we can find an algebraic function, in other words, a polynomial, such that when we insert that number into the polynomial, we get zero. Perhaps in more fancy language, a number is algebraic if it's given by the root of a polynomial with rational coefficients. So let's think of some examples of algebraic numbers. Well, any rational number, for example, take one third, that's certainly algebraic, since we could just take the polynomial x minus one third. On the other hand, the number square root of two is also algebraic, since I can take the polynomial x squared minus two. So a number is said to be transcendental if it is not algebraic. In other words, if alpha is a transcendental number, then alpha is not the root of any polynomial with rational coefficients. So as we alluded to in the introduction, both pi and Euler's number are transcendental. It's not possible to find a polynomial with rational coefficients such that f of pi is zero or f of e is zero. No such polynomial exists. So given that both pi and Euler's number are transcendental, and pi has such an elementary description, we want to know whether Euler's number admits a geometric description in a similar manner. The ancient Greeks had a candidate for what makes a number geometric, numbers that we now refer to as constructibles. A number is constructible if it can be built from straight lines using only a ruler and a compass. So let's show that if a and b are constructible numbers, then the product is also constructible. That'll give us a feel for how these constructible numbers work. So we can use our ruler to draw a line of length 1. Forming any angle relative to this line, we'll draw the line segment of length a. Now we know how to do that since a is constructible. Join the edges of these two lines 
to form the triangle that we see here. Now extend this horizontal line in such a way that the total length is now given by B. Again, we know how to do that since B is also assumed to be constructible. Extend this line in the way that we have here and measure using your compass the angle between the initial line and A and draw a parallel line with the same angle. You can show by similarity of triangles that the resulting length here is exactly AB. In other words, we've shown that if A is constructible and B is constructible, then A times B is also constructible. Unfortunately, pi is not a constructible number. Galois theory, whatever that is, tells us that alpha is constructible if and only if it's given by the root of some quadratic polynomial with rational coefficients. Pi is transcendental, so no such polynomial exists by definition. So constructible numbers are not really the geometric interpretation of numbers that we're looking for. Remember, we're asking whether E is geometric in the sense that pi is geometric. So we may need to ask a more general question. Namely, what is geometry? What is the geometric interpretation that we're looking for?